shut down and everything. From like March and through like most of May, it was gone. But like since the end of May to now, I've been getting like steady hours. Like I worked like 35 hours this week. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we are going live right now. Or I think we might actually be live. Yep, we're live. So uh, today we are going to talk to Cameron Zinsu, soon to be Dr. Cameron Zinsu. And we're going to be playing Battlefield 5. And we're going to be learning about the invasion of southern France, something that I know nothing about uh, during World War II. The, um, would you call this the bastard stepchild of uh, D-Day and the Normandy invasion? Would that uh, be oh. oh, you're talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would that be an accurate description, soon to be Dr. Cameron Zinsu? It would not be an accurate description. Uh, Operation Dragoon was meant to launch simultaneously with Operation Overlord. They were supposed to be the two, quote, supreme operations of 1944 for the Allies. Uh, they're supposed to happen concurrently and be a giant pincer movement that occurred in two places at once in France. So if you imagine, you know, the D normal D-Day invasion going through Normandy, and then you had a simultaneous invasion going through southern France. That's what Eisenhower and other Allied leaders had imagined happening with Operation Well, the thing is, though, I don't care about this. You're going to make me care about this. So what we're going to be doing over the next hour is you're going to be proving... Oh, here we go. After bloody victory, beach Normandy, Dragoon, blah, blah. Um, you've got to prove to me over this next hour that this is, uh, this is as exciting as Operation Overlord. The invasion of Normandy, okay? I mean, the the I, I I'm not gonna do that. The the combat, <laughs> the combat was a, uh, it was, it was a, um, a magisterial effort of Allied planning and a preparation for the operation, um, and it was the most successful amphibious operation the United States launched during World War II, easily. So, better than Operation Overlord. Make that case for me. Oh, I mean. There were 395 casualties on D-Day versus, you know, whatever thousands and thousands there were in Normandy. The Allies landed 100,000 men on D-Day for uh, Operation Dragoon. And the eventually, the French army, uh, which participated in it, along with the... Des soldats français courageux, prêts à se sacrifier pour la patrie. Hold on, you're breaking up. This The sound breaks up periodically on this. I, I don't know how to fix it. C'était des héros. Well, hopefully Cameron is going to come back here. Let me, um... Hold on, let me try and get this. This happens every single time I do this silly thing. Can you hear me? Yeah, dude. Okay, so France. I, in, France is participating in this. That's what this mission is. I don't know much about it. I think it might be French um, colonial troops or something like that. That's exactly right. Uh, Trailleur is uh, essentially the name for a rifleman of a French colonial soldier. Okay. Uh, and yeah, the the first free French army is the French army that landed uh, in Provence uh, with the U.S. 7th Army. And they were primarily composed of Algerian and Tunisian uh, colonial soldiers. Okay. So this guy's from Algeria or something? He's probably uh, from Senegal. Senegal. That's what I. That's what I, I was uh, told. So there were Sen Senegalese troops as well. Uh, yeah. So Algerian, Moroccan, Tunisian, uh, Senegalese were the primary uh, soldiers used. Let me. I'll bring up the order of battle real quick on the operation. Actually, while, while you're doing that, why does France get a pass? Like, you know, so the French they kind of sort of fought in Africa with, with the Germans after getting taken over. I know Vichy France and all that. But, like, we kind of forget that. Like, like it seems... I don't know. I don't even know how to ask this question. But, like, it seems like the, the French are sort of forgiven. They fought on the German side in, in North Africa. Is that correct? Uh, quite briefly, uh, what happened is that after... France surrendered in 1940. Um, Vichy France was given an officially a neutral status, but essentially they became a puppet regime uh, under the Nazis. And 
Uh, yeah, during Vichy, they were supposed to contest the beaches, and there were some French units that complied, but there were also actually a lot of uh, Vichy French military units that did nothing and uh, surrendered arms as soon as they came across Allied soldiers. In any case, as soon as the Allies landed in North Africa, uh, Germany occupied the remainder of France and disarmed the Armistice Army of Vichy France. Vichy was allowed a hundred thousand man, a peacekeeping army, essentially a peacekeeping army for like vague defense. Uh, but after uh, Germany occupied the remainder of the country, they disbanded that force. Okay. So um, these guys are getting kicked in the nuts. Did, did uh, France kick its colonial troops in the nuts? Like did it, were they treated poorly? Uh, no, they were actually heavily depended on, uh, both, uh, during the, at the beginning of the war and as, uh, the war progressed, because when France surrenders, when France loses the Battle of France, you know, it's like a million and a half soldiers get captured by the Germans. And so, where is, you know, free France going to raise the majority of its troops that'll help liberate the country? And... The answer is the colonies, uh, which remained under uh, free French control. Uh, here, I don't know if this is on the beach or if this is like weeks into it. I think uh, this might be a couple weeks into it. Okay, so the river that you see is probably the Rhone River, which is, comprises the Rhone Valley. And uh, it's uh, really the only kind of passable terrain uh, that you can go up from the south of France up through to, uh, you can essentially take the entire Rhone Valley up to the, the German border with France. Um, because on either side of the valley, you know, there, there are mountains to the east would be the, the Alps, and to the west would be the Massif Central, which are uh, ancient uh, mountains that have uh, eroded over time. Oh shit, that guy just shot a... A bazooka at me. Is that a thing they would do? Why would they waste bazookas on just a dude, I guess? I, I thought they were all anti-tank. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, yeah, no, you don't use bazookas against uh, against infantry units. Okay. Anti-tank weapons. So free the, France, just for like people... Air, sorry, go ahead. The German variant would be the Panzerfaust, not the bazooka. That's the American... Uh, anti-tank weapon. Is there like a German band called Scheisenfaust? Somebody if from a comedy had like shit fist as a as a name. Never mind. I'm I'm not gonna get into that. I saw a comedy I, movie that said that. No, I, anyway. No, I, <laughs> um, but um, I wasn't gonna say. So these guys here, these colonial troops, free France. Are they ruling out of England? Uh, no. Actually, the the majority of the first free French army had participated in combat in Italy. Um, and so in preparation for the invasion of Southern France, these uh, French divisions were withdrawn from Italy and uh, they did their mission prep for the invasion of Southern France in Corsica. Awesome. So right there in the middle of the Mediterranean for- Yeah. Okay. So was there any talk, and you might, this might be out of your field, but like, so Vietnam, they and you know uh, Indochina. This sets off basically this independence movement. Uh, World War II, uh, you know, get invaded by the Japanese. But I guess Senegal didn't get invaded. But was it weird in the French colonies having your home country getting taken over by the Germans? Like, they're like, was there any thought like, why the heck are we staying with these guys when they're not even in charge of their own stuff? Uh, so the the way that you know, it was pitched, and it's not, it's not necessarily, right, like, individual, like, Senegalese in people, and, you know, in Senegal, you know, it's in West Africa, so, there's actually quite I don't know little, what the melee button is, sorry. <laughs> there's actually quite little, um, not agency, but, like, people, like, civilians don't really have that much. Uh, I guess voice. They don't have that much voice, right? They're not represented in sure. the decision process. So the decisions whether or not to ally yourself with Vichy France or with De Gaulle and Free France 
um, fell primarily to the military administrators and governors that uh, inhabited each colony. Was there any promise, like, did Germany say to Senegal, like, because, like, it seems like a very smart thing to do, but it seems like a very un-Nazi thing to do, like, say to the Senegalese, like, hey, you guys, you know, get your independence or something, or... Well, no, so it's not that. So, like, Germany never, uh, like, took control of the colonies, right? They wanted... Well, North they... Algeria, right, or in uh, Morocco. Well, no, they never, they never formally took over any... I mean... Right, so they occupied the parts. That... Germany only entered North Africa because the Italians were attempting to take on the British, and they're getting their asses kicked. Yep. And so Hitler just dispensed, you know, Rommel. You know, that's where he gets, makes his name as the Desert Fox. Um. But by you know summer 1942. Uh, the, the British defeated the Germans at El Alamein and began pushing them back uh, across, you know, the North African coastline in the Mediterranean. Uh, but they never really pushed, you know, westward because there were no, in, there were, there wasn't any enemy there. They they were focused exclusively on the British because that's where the combat was. Sure, but they didn't send guys. So, like, I guess I'm talking about this in the sense of Napoleon, like Napoleon never took over the Americas, but like he would send guys out to promote independence movements, you know, because he realized if there's chaos or if, you know, they break away. But I guess if v Germany's controlling VC France, and I guess they... I guess I don't know. That's confusing. Well, no, so... Uh, right, what Hitler didn't want to do is have to micromanage France. Okay. He wanted, he wanted a France capable of governing itself that was neutral or favorable to the German cause. And so, you know, he, you know, he had enough on his hands trying to defeat the Soviet Union, uh, you know, after June 1941. And so he, the Western Front really became like an afterthought. I mean, the, you know, the vast majority of German resources were dedicated to the Eastern Front. And so anything that would ease the burden of German administration and soldier requirements you know, it's what they, it's what they would, you know, take. But he didn't have like, like one dude or something, like, you know, one German guy down in, like, uh, Senegal or whatever, saying, you know, hey. You no, know. It, if something like that occurred, it would all be North Africa. The Germans never sent any forces to Senegal or West Africa. Okay, so they they had no inch. That's crazy. Like, it just seems like. If you devoted a couple guys to, to, you know, doing something like that, then the enemy would have to devote a lot of resources to, you know, counter that. But I guess. Well, as long as they had a loyal Vichy France government or one that was, you know, sympathetic, if not, you know, outright allied with the Germans, then, then they they didn't have to worry about that, you know. But, but wouldn't, aren't you saying that Senegal though would be under the um, oh fucking shit. Um, Senegal, wouldn't that be remain control under free France, I guess is what I'm asking. Like, didn't they have, like, people down there, or maybe did the French have people down there saying, hey, listen to us instead of the free French? Well, no, no, the free French would be saying, yeah. So, it, it really, it depends on, it really depended on the, the, like, the military governor or the civilian governor. Um, the administrative apparatus of the colony is generally, who di especially in West Africa, is who dictated whether or not that colony would ally itself with Vichy France or with Free France. You know, we're talking about administrative matters, and I've got like a guy shooting me with a flamethrower. Like, I don't know. I, I should probably concentrate on that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm answering the questions you asked, Brad. That's all no, I know that's what I'm saying. Like that's the kind of the stuff that I find interesting. I like flamethrowers as well, but uh, so I, I've got to probably focus on what other. People I, I, I brought a. Um, I got the order of battle up. So it was the for dragoon. It was first uh, foot infantry division, first armored division, third Algerian infantry division, ninth uh, infant colonial infantry division. Um, and then three... These words mean nothing to me. So, 
essentially there are three Moroccan regiments, um, one Algerian regiment, one Algerian division, um, and then uh, a colonial division made up of West Africans. So that would be Senegal, Benin, um, and other West African French territories. Okay. So flamethrowers, would they a big? You don't even. Maybe I just. You know. Again, I'm. I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, super intelligent on this time. But I always think of flamethrowers in the Pacific. Uh, not really the. Um, Europe. Were they a big deal in this this uh, Operation Dragoon? Uh, I wouldn't know that. Um, and I especially wouldn't know the kinds of. I wouldn't know the composition of individual, you know, a French squad. Yeah. Uh, they were they were almost entirely uh, supplied by the Americans. Uh, so I think it would stand to reason that a lot of their units would be would take the shape of American ones. Okay. Really? So the I guess somebody's got to supply them, and they're not getting it from France itself. So this right. might be, not be something you know. Is this an American gun? This guy's using. No, that doesn't look American. Yeah, it doesn't look American. You fucking. Sorry, I, I tend to cuss. I mean, I, I've always done that, Brian. <laughs> I know, I know, but uh, apparently I do it a lot when I'm. And this is on easy too. Like I put it on easy so I can talk, but. Um... Sure, of course. Is this look like the photos, or is this like what you would envision? Uh this particular battle or one of the parts of the invasion of southern France or is this uh so if this is a couple weeks in uh so it'd be around the end of August this doesn't I saw uh those tank traps earlier I feel like this probably is close to uh Marseille or Toulon on the outskirts of town uh before you get into the city, but at the same time, you know, the trees are brown. So it could be even that they're further inland, getting close to the Vosges Mountains, where uh, Germans had begun constructing uh, very uh, elaborate fortifications. Like you have the West Wall further north, uh, near the Ruhr Valley. Uh, you had similar kinds of intricate fortifications in the south as the Allies approached the Franco German. Do you know how I'm fucking... I don't know how I'm supposed to kill this thing. Ooh, I'm sorry, buddy. Maybe I'll just do it with a grenade. No, that's not a grenade. You're gonna blow yourself up. I know. Oh, I did it. Okay. Oh, nice. There you go. Um, that is not how you would disable uh, an enemy artillery piece. How would I do it? Uh, you would have to uh, jam... You would have to disrupt the... Um, the uh, what is it? The muzzle? Sure. The the breach thing? I don't know what the fuck it's called. I know what you're saying. The uh, the long part. What the fuck is the long part of the barrel? Yeah, the barrel. There we go. Yeah, you have to sabotage that. You know, in Band of Brothers when they put a little grenade in there and like disrupts the and, like blows up the barrel. So why like, is no... Oh shit. Or where you load munitions, you know, you could you could you know gum gum it up there to disable it another way. Okay. So going back to that question, why is there no Band of Brothers or movie about about this? Uh, because everyone, like Americans, love a, a tough battle where they overcome adversity, right? You think about all the great battles of World War II that the United States fought. Yeah. Deep Battle of the Bulge, you know, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Guadalcanal. There's like all very intense firefights and situations where the Americans eventually prevail. Yep. In France. Not only is half the force comprised of French colonial soldiers, but there wasn't a really tough battle that the United States fought. Um, the closest that they would come to is the Battle of Mont Salimar, uh, where they essentially tried to do an encirclement of the German army as it retreated from southern France. They partially succeeded in, you know, gravely mauled the German 19th Army, but they didn't effectively. Uh, you know, encircle and force that army to surrender. So, so, 
would would it have been a loss if it, like if uh you know they weren't invading from the other part of France then or or was it basically the French that won this thing? No, 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 not at all. So the French captured Marseille and Toulon, uh, but the U.S. Seventh Army. Well, the French army was, you know, conducting essentially a siege of these two cities. The American army was trying to gallivant into the interior of France. Um, and, you know, it was... There wasn't any part where the United States suffered a tactical defeat. Um, operationally, tactically, and strategically, it was a success for the United States. Um... It's just that it was almost too easy, so there isn't there isn't a lot of controversy. The controversy around Operation Dragoon is about whether or not it should have happened at all. Okay. Um, that was a large debate between uh, the Americans and the British whether or not it could go forward. So this seems pretty contested. Is this fictionalized or is this, you know, accurate? But it's just not Americans. The... I'd have to know exactly what part of France they're in right now and the date. And, to provide contacts, uh, so I don't know exactly. Okay. I feel like I feel like I don't know. Let me see. This is Battlefield Five. Yep. So mm. it was supposed to go off right as D-Day and Operation Overlord. Who's this guy? All right. Um, so this. Okay. So the guy presented here is Senegalese. Uh, oh, this is dumb as hell. This is so. This is like historical fiction. This is. Well, I mean, no, like. Well, I know it's not a real guy, but. This exact freaking kind of assault or whatever. Uh huh. Like the way I'm reading this is. Yeah, they're called war stories. What the fuck is this? Oh, that guy almost blew me up with that thing. So I think they're taking it, and basically nobody's, but maybe Audie Murphy or whatever's out there killing as many people as you're killing in this. Even Audie Murphy didn't kill as many people, but uh. Actually, so I think they're exaggerating stuff. Actually, Audie Murphy participated in Operation Dragoon. That's where he he was with us, uh, the Seventh Army. Oh, really? Yeah, he's. That's how he got all his medals. Was uh, the invasion of Southern France and uh, fighting with the Seventh Seventh Army and uh, Southern or in Eastern France, which would be also Southern Germany. So there were we were, you know, killing all these guys like you know just oh, hundreds absolutely. or whatever I'm doing the, here. Out of Montelimar, the United States suffered like a few thousand casualties, fifteen hundred dead. In contrast with uh, like ten or eleven thousand German dead, and like so we uh, got them like thousand. five to one or something like that. Oh shit! That? So we oh crap! Hold on, sorry. So it was a uh, disproportionate ca casualties. I'm I'm guessing. I mean, I guess that's the way the o Americans operated. Is they just made sure they were gonna win before they started the battle. Well, it wasn't. Just that is that the German 19th Army was also severely undermanned and poorly equipped. Probably a bunch uh, of kids. A lot of second and third rate soldiers. They even had uh, the Ost Battalions, and the Ost Battalions were uh, foreign uh, soldiers conscripted into the German Army, like Lithuanian, Soviet, uh, Yugoslavian, Polish. Like, they, by the four, 1944, Germany's really hurting for soldiers. Uh -huh. and so there's some units that are made up entirely of, you know, these foreign units. They're, these soldiers are impressed into German service. I like the um, the story about the Korean guy. I think I've told this story before. But uh, uh, okay. it's uh, conscripted by Japan, and mm -hmm. then he's conscripted by Russia, and then he's conscripted by Germany, and then he eventually gets captured at D-Day. Have you, have you heard any wild ass stories from here? Like, have you interviewed people, or you know, in all your research, or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, so I interviewed a guy who uh, he was 14 years old when Germany 
when the Germans were occupying Montelimar, and he, uh, the Gestapo had gone around and arresting a bunch of people, um, and they walked into his classroom, his eighth grade classroom, and took out one of his uh, classmates. His name was Daniel Titelman, and uh, he was Jewish, and he was uh, deported to Auschwitz where he died. Um, I also, in the flat I lived in in Montelimar when I was conducting my dissertation research, I lived 50 yards away from a house where the Gestapo broke into that house, uh, murdered uh, a Jewish man, took his wife, drove her out to the countryside and murdered her. Um, and I found all of that in my research. Like, morally, blah, 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 that's wrong and stuff, but, like, strategically, that just seems like a huge waste of resources. I mean, like, yeah, the Holocaust as a whole, yeah, there's a, a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of scholarship on that. Okay. Um, so, oh, yeah, fun thing, I, I was talking to a guy the other day, he was, uh, he's writing a, a book on this uh, American teacher who did, like, a, uh, exchange program with Germany. Speaking of schools, just reminded, reminded me of this, but, uh, he was saying that, like, he was put in charge of this German kids' school, uh, like, women's school, and he thought he was going to be going over there teaching sciences and stuff like that. Um, but he said that, like, all day was just P.E. because they wanted to get the kids ready to get the uniform on. Like, he's like... And then they would stop listening to teachers because they just wanted to fight. And these were girls. Like, he's like... He's like, basically, this is like just a bunch of animals yelling at me all day. Have you heard anything like that? Uh, no, I'm not familiar with that. No, I mean, I, th I think the guy's kind of, uh, he's, he's just starting to work on it. But anyway, that, that school thing reminded me of that. I don't know, what the, what am I doing here, Cameron? Uh, where does it tell you to go? Where's the know. objective? By the way, you can't see Cameron. He's incredibly handsome. He's a he's a very handsome guy. I haven't seen you in person in uh, probably four seven. or five years. Oh, it's seven years. Se it's been seven years. Yeah, I left. I left UNT in 2013. Have you fallen off the wagon? No, I'm still pretty fit. Still a handsome gentleman. Okay, good. I try. I try to be. Okay. I I think um. So I think you can beat me up now because I can't beat anybody up now. Although I am going through a, a handsome revival. For whatever reason, like when I hit 40, I started looking handsome. So, hey, um, you know, well, I mean, we ran that half marathon together. I still have that picture of us. Yeah, well, you were so in shape then, and, and like I don't even know how I was able to run that. Like I was just... Uh, it's very impressed. Yes. <laughs> I, I, for whatever reason, I had a lot of weight, but I was able to, to run, so... Hey, none of us know we're as fat as... Or, uh, not fat, as uh, in shape as Andy Torgid. If yeah. Fast ran like a full marathon over the course of that relay. He stole my idea. Did I tell you this? So like, it was my idea to do um, the world's longest history lecture. But really? He, yeah, but he took it. I don't. I don't think he did it on purpose. I think we were talking about it, and I would never have done it. So I, I'm not upset about it. But <laughs> like, I wouldn't. I, that's just something I'd throw out there. I was gonna do, but in reality, I wouldn't do it. I was very proud of him for doing it. I was too. He did, he did a really good job. Yeah, Steve, he did. But again, the idea is mine, so don't, don't give him too much credit. Uh, hello there, guy. Yeah. Oh, you're good guy. So, wait, in what year did you get your PhD? 2014. Oh, okay, so like, a year after I left. That's what's up. Yeah. Have you, you been at you ever... Mississippi State since then, is that right? Yeah, I've been, yeah, God. What do you mean, God? That's, that's awesome. I've been here so long, I'm so ready to be done, dude. Well, you're almost done. I am. Okay. Wait, so where do you teach now? I forget where you teach. What the, don't worry about all that right now. We gotta talk about France and how no, handsome we are. No, just totally asking all these bullshit questions. I get to ask you questions. No, you don't. <laughs> no, nah, and like I, I try to keep uh, my personal life out of things, but I try to like, try to include everybody else's personal life. Okay, fair, fair. Yeah, Let's so see. that's just the way it operates. A giver, not a taker. Yes. So, okay. So why are these guys wearing red? I've never seen... I've never seen uh, Germans wear red uniforms. Do you have any idea? Uh, I mean, yeah. So it would be to, it's a kind of camo. Blend in with the foliage. Oh! 
Well, that's shitty. It's it. It's red, you know, and the the foliage is orange. So whoever they're designing. So the trees. Look at the trees. They're all orange as fuck. That's what I'm saying. But like they're wearing red. That's that's straight red. Man, I wouldn't be able to see it. With my blind ass. Okay, I guess. All right. Well, tell me more interesting stuff about Operation Dragoon. Uh, it almost caused the allies to break apart. What do you mean? So like it's, uh, they were debating it, and uh, if the first big debate happened at uh, when Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt met for the first time, uh huh. Roosevelt was like, "Yeah, we should go through southern France." Eisenhower's like, "Yeah, let's go through southern France." And Churchill was like, "No, no, 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 let's go to the Balkans." And Stalin was like, "No, no, no. In my experience, we have the most success against the Germans when we concentrate our forces um, through two separate attacks." So I think. A southern France invasion in conjunction with an invasion from Normandy would produce the best result. So that's how Anvil, at the time it was called Operation Anvil, that's how Anvil and Normandy became the two supreme operations of 1944. And it's in like uh, the combined chiefs of staff, it's in their official notes. So um, w was it the reason that uh, Churchill didn't want to do it? Like, like I, you always hear that he really did want the Germans and the Soviets to kill one another. Like, is, is, or basically, he didn't want to. He didn't mind them killing each other. He didn't want to waste Brit British lives. Did he think this was going to cost a lot of lives or something? Um. So that's part of it. Uh. But the British contributed very little to the operation. Um. They provided the naval forces, but they provided essentially no. Um. Ground forces to the invasion. It was entirely French and American. And, uh. But Churchill didn't want to do it because he wanted to go to the ball. I don't want this gun. And, like, but but who talked him out of it? Stalin or? Where the hell did my good gun go? There's a really good gun I had here. I'm going to use this. Alright. Can you hear me again? because the Union were still our allies. Churchill was already looking beyond that. Um, perhaps most importantly, though, Eisenhower really wanted the operation. He wanted that pincer movement. He wanted the open ports of Marseille. Uh, ironically, though, uh, Churchill lobbied for Operation Shingle, which was the Allied invasion at Anzio in January 1944. And that quickly became bogged down, and because it did, it took away resources for our planning for Anvil, and because of that, Anvil actually ended up being cancelled and delayed and pushed back. So that it ended up happening two months after Overlord. Because in its original conception, Anvil was supposed to be an operation that would draw German forces away from Normandy. And so then make it easier for the Allies to break out of Normandy. When in actuality, the opposite happened. The Allies had broken out of Normandy and the Germans withdrew all their forces from southern France. Normandy leaving southern France extremely weakened and making it very easy for so like so this would be Germans by this time this happened this is like the least of their concern like would most German forces just run away when they saw the Allies come or surrender like did most so, Germans realize uh, everything's over it's it's that by the time Operation Dragoon happens the Allies have already broken out of Normandy um, and they're trying to encircle and chase down German units that are ex retreating. And the f there was a real danger that if units in the German units in southern France didn't retreat, as the units in north northern France were retreating, that they would get cut off from their ability to retreat if the Allies overran them. So about the time Operation Dragoon happened, Hitler ordered uh, Army Group G, which is the army group that's protecting southern France, to withdraw. Uh, so they were, the German army was essentially conducting a fighting retreat for most of, uh, the campaign. This may be something you don't know, like, seeing these guys, uh, victorious, I don't know, and it, you, you might not know this either, but, uh, Senegal, did it, did, was there any fighting for its independence, or just France just like, you know, whatever, the, you know, this thing's over, or was it like Vietnam, where after the war they, I mean, again, it, it wasn't exactly the same, because they didn't get, get taken over like Vietnam, but, like, are some of the guys that are fighting here, 
the same guys are going to be pushing for independence or was do you do you know anything about that so what ends up happening is not necessarily in Senegal. Uh, in West Africa, what happened is that the uh, French eventually just ended up withdrawn. Okay, um, that's what I figured. The African colonies didn't receive their independence until between 1955 and 1965. Uh, but in Algeria, uh, veterans from the war took their fighting expertise back to Algeria. Um, and we see in, you know, 1954, that's where, you know, the Algerian War for Independence takes takes root in a lot of oh god what's happening well i don't know they're going to take a gun in placement or something uh but it's really in algeria where you see the lessons that uh later the the insurgents against french rule they they take a lot of experience and combat training from fighting in World War II back there to help foment the revolution there that eventually overthrows the French. So that's kind of what, what I'm doing in the, hopefully the new book, uh, hopefully it'll be out next year, probably the year after that, but um, it's, it's basically about a guy, so the Spanish are fighting these Apaches, and their idea was basically to use the Apaches as scouts against other Apaches, and, um, and one of the guys they used ended up turning on them uh, and, and that's what the book's about. And I just think that's, it seems like that's like a big MO you see in um, colonial warfare or whatever is, hey, we don't want to do the fighting, we'll let somebody else do it for us. Oh, shit, that guy's now fighting us. So that's what basically what happened in Algeria. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So in, my, in real life, I'd be destroyed if a machine gun's firing right at me, right? Yeah, you, you'd be dead in. Yeah. I mean, you know about World War One. That's all that was. Yeah. Well, I gotta play dumb. I gotta, I gotta. I mean, it's some of the stuff I know, but then other stuff I don't know. But then I, I play dumb. So when I don't know something, people assume that I know it, but I'm playing dumb. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I play dumb to help people learn, but I also play dumb because I am. Yeah. You're gonna become a major influencer, Instagram influencer no. with your video. No, I just do yeah. this for fun. I really do. I, I don't. You're gonna, you're gonna get your own uh, television show on like on Nickelodeon or some shit. I don't think anybody cares about television anymore. And you say that, but I watch a lot of sports on television. Well, sports, but that's it. Yeah, well, esports that's on television. I used to watch Overwatch League, but they uh kind of got boring uh, after a while. <laughs> Yeah. Do you watch it? What esports do you watch? I don't watch any esports. I just know it exists. Okay. Do you watch baseball? I watch Formula One and soccer. That is so pretentious. <laughs> it's so European. I'm so European. I'm so cultured, Brad. How was France when you were over there? That guy. I don't know why I'm not hitting this guy. Was was France a France a party when you went over there? I mean, I lived in a pretty small town, so and I didn't have a car, so I lived a couple miles away from where the party scene was, and transportation was difficult, so I didn't really get to party all that much. I did, however, drink a lot of wine and eat a lot of cheese. Did everybody know you in town? Like, was it was it that small? Like, oh, there's that American or anything. It's like, it's like uh, 35,000 people. Oh, okay. So not that yeah. small. Yeah. Okay. It's walkable, though. You know, like, a lot of old European cities, you know, are really condensed. So you can get, like, walk from one side of town to the other in about 15 minutes. The old city, at least. Girls? The girls like the American, or they, they hate you? I didn't actually date anyone in France until, like, the last two months I was there. I was going through a bad breakup then. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It's okay, you know. It's I'm doing, I'm telling you for the channel. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you're, you're too emotional. You need to stop with all this emotion nonsense and just, uh... Yeah. Become a, an this emotionless what, husk I, like I, I am. Oh my! What would you do if I was like started breaking down? And I was just like, <laughs> I'm so sad. I don't know. Like I, I'd like to think I'd laugh at you, but <laughs> in, in in reality, I'd probably you know, oh, you know, try to just calm you down so it's not embarrassing. Because I think I just get embarrassed. <laughs> so. Um, you get all, as soon as we get off, you just tell yourself, like, oh, god damn, I've made a huge mistake. No. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, 
pretty much after a dragoon happens and it ends, pretty much the entire front stabilizes along the Franco-German border from about October of 1944 up through February, March, when Allies start making like really big gains uh, across the Rhine and uh, getting into Germany and start, and that's when the whole front essentially begins to collapse. So, but the German troops are getting captured here. Like, like, are there a lot surrendering, realizing that I, you kind of explained this, but I want to get this a little bit more. Like, do they realize when, when these guys are coming, when the fucking war's over, or are they sort of bought into the propaganda? We can still win this thing. It just takes a little bit of luck. Or... Well, no. Like, you know, by this stage of the war, all, m almost all of Germany's best soldiers are all already dead. Yep. The second and third class soldiers that are fighting, you know, they don't really have a stomach for it. Um, so, you know, where you have, uh, where you have experienced non com you know, you, you tend to have better units. Uh, any SS units that are around, if you're in the vicinity of an SS unit, you better bet your ass that you're fighting, uh, because not to do so could result in, you know, the SS you know, for having the Gestapo arrest, you know, people from the unit for not displaying, you know, sufficient zeal or loyalty to Hitler. Yeah. Do you know um, any stories about, like, the Germans getting mad about getting beat by Senegalese troops or anything like that? Like, is there any... Or are they just, like, fuck, man? Uh, I mean, there's probably some stuff out there about... Uh, but most of it is, uh takes place in like 1940 when you have German like German you have you know anti-African uh, German propaganda you know Africans are subhuman uh, so in the Battle of France they say you know take no mercy on these you know African soldiers you know the, these almost primal you know depicting them as subhuman uh, giving them like primal ape qualities you know they're, they're, they're savage and ferocious and you know they're they're uncontrollable they're they're a threat to white civilization those kinds of things but in terms of what's happening in 1944 and german encounters with Senegalese soldiers unless you know those soldiers were interviewed and or recorded their experiences during the time it's probably gonna be pretty difficult to capture those voices and I imagine, like, there wasn't much funding for, like, the propaganda department by this point, you know, like... No, not not at all. I don't even know what kinds of, uh, propaganda, you know, they were spewing out in 1944. I saw that one thing where they were, um, they are releasing that movie about the Titanic, and, like, they finished it in 1945 after a huge delay or whatever. You, you heard anything about that? Mm -mm. Like, they started funding it in 1940... They, they wanted, mother, what is, I guess it was on fire. Um, but they started in 1940, but then, you know, delays in production. And then, like, it finally was starting to get done by, like, 44, but they didn't want to release it because it was about a captain that foolishly ran his ship into an iceberg, and then the passengers going down with the ship, and everybody thought that would be a uh, uh, too much of a metaphor for what's happening in Germany. So I think they spent all this money on this, but they didn't release it. That's hilarious. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that poor guy. Do you ever watch uh, that documentary about uh, those like evangelical Jesus loving kids? I forget what it's called. No, I don't think I've seen that. It's a super, super famous. The six evangelical documentary. Jesus Camp. Yeah, did you ever watch Jesus Camp? I have not seen it. Yeah, that shit came out in 2006. That was like the, the height and the craze of like, you know, neoliberalism and, and you know, the wedding of the evangelical church and evangelical people to, to you know, the Republican Party. Kind of movies like crazy as... Movies crazy as hell. Man, I... Is it? It's a documentary. Yeah, it came out in 2006. Okay, I, I gotta watch it because I I watch a lot of true crime documentaries these days. 
And I like, uh, have you seen the whites of West Virginia or the weird and wild whites of West Virginia or something like that? How do you watch all these murder documentaries? Ah, uh, because it's fun. I, I want to think I can solve them. No, you want to commit them. I, I might. I might. <laughs> I might. I, I do kind of have this fascination. There's one on HBO about um, the Golden State Killer that I'm Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, by uh, Michelle McNamara. Dude, yeah, Patton Os Oswalt's wife. Right. Name? Yeah. In order to, yeah, it's Michelle. Yeah, I know that. Um, it's okay. I listen to a lot of I listen to a lot of true crime, true crime podcasts. Which um, which ones? Uh, serial killers, crime junkie, and red handed. Have you have you seen the one or listened to the one about uh whether Winds of Change was written by the CIA, the Scorpion song? No way, no. I, I, I haven't. So that's a question posed. So uh, there's a song. I really like the song. It's uh, but it became like sort of the anthem of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Mother crap! I'm doing terrible. Um, but basically, rumor got out there that it was actually written and and sung by the CIA. And I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, it, it's. I'm not gonna give give anything away. But it's it's an interesting listen. That's one I've. Been to. Yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah. So this guy right here, there are paratroopers involved in this thing. Where are they launching from? The beach? Uh, I guess. So it was, there was a um, division-sized airborne unit that was in Operation Dragoon. It's called uh, the First Airborne Task Force. Um, and it's it was, uh, the only British troops that participated in the entire operation were part of the uh, First Airborne Task Force. It was a conglomeration of British, American, and French paratroopers. It was a, like a multinational parachute division. Wow, shit balls. Oh, sorry. And I, I know I should be professional and not say shit balls. So is that unique? Is this like the only multinational? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's they, fun. Uh, well, I mean, really, though, it happened because like they had to that scrap together a bunch of I different units because a lot of like you, you know you had the 82nd and the 101st airborne they're they're in northern europe uh getting ready for operation market garden so are all the british airborne units um and so like you had a couple you know battalions here and a couple battalions there of trained airborne troops and uh yeah it all got the commander of it was a uh, robert robert t frederick he was the commander of the first airborne task force when it landed, and they had they had no problems landing whatsoever. Like no resistance at all. Like were there the pillboxes yeah. and stuff like that? No, they were able to accomplish their objectives, wreak havoc behind enemy lines, and link up quickly with Allied soldiers as they were advancing from the beach. And what 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 American was it? The eighty second, you said, or the? The no, the 82nd and the 101st are in, are in uh, getting ready for Operation Market Garden. Okay. So, okay, all right. Well, that's uh, fun. Tell me more French stuff or I'm going to ask you about, you know, girlfriends and things. Have you ever heard of French kissing? I, I, I've, I've heard of it, but, you know, nobody will do it with me. What about a menage a trois? Oh, come on. You can't talk about that. Now, see, there's a line, and you're crossing it. <laughs> you are crossing it, young man. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Operation Dragoon was extremely important for the French because the first genuine opportunity they had to help liberate their own soil. But the irony with that is, is that it's not actually French men who are doing that it's french colonial soldiers who are liberating french soil and so it really showcases the degree to which france relied on its colonial soldiers uh throughout the war um and especially during the last the last uh part of it and we kind of talked about this before but like did this did the colonies get anything from france for this like was there any like thanks a lot guys or france is worried about getting its own shit back together. This is definitely, definitely, uh, thanks a lot, guys. Okay, now continue to serve us. Um, actually, what happens throughout the course, the fall and winter of 1944, is what's called the Blanchemont, 
of the French army. So while colonial soldiers are liberating France and actively fighting, uh, there's a large, you know, resistance force in France itself. French resistance. Um, after France largely gets liberated, those French resistance soldiers are conscripted into the French army. And what happens is that over time, this blanchiment, which literally means the whitening, the white French soldiers, white French resistance soldiers, replace colonial soldiers. Um, and the colonial soldiers are then sent to garrison duty elsewhere in Is France or sent back to the colonies. So did, um, they did the hard shit and then, I don't know, and yeah. then they sort of got pushed to the side. Yeah, I got pushed to the side of Forgotten, and then the Blanchiment, you know, they, they're the ones who say, you know, we're re we are the reconstituted French army, when really the only French army that had been fighting since France's surrender had largely been that of the colonial soldiers. Um, man, that's kind of a, a bummer, but I guess that's sort of par for the course. Was there, like, any, like thank you days in France or anything like that. I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to... I don't know. That makes me a little angry, but... Uh, I mean... Like, uh, after the war, was there any, like... Did they get uh, the same benefits, or did they get anything? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why am I so terrible at this one? I swear, I was not this terrible before this. Is it because I'm impatient? I think it's because you have a, a hidden animosity towards French colonial soldiers, and it's causing you to die intentionally. So I'm I'm withholding shooting the German soldiers because of my hatred for the Senegalese. I'm, I'm, I feel like psychologically, I'm not far from the truth. I mean, hey, that you know, I'm, I mean, I I don't know myself. I I, I spend my entire life hiding from myself, so <laughs> that may very well be true. Uh, where's is Senegal's West Africa? Is it is it near? Like Gambia and, and all that. And let me educate you on some geography. Yes, please do. So Senegal, as we have already established, is in West <laughs> Africa. Yes. It is. You're looking that up. Hell yeah, I'm looking this up. I don't remember. But well, you're that, actually... that makes me feel good then. So. Yeah, Mauritania is to the north of Senegal, and Gambia is to the south, and Guinea-Bissau also borders uh, Senegal. Can I tell you my story about Mauritania? Tell me. They still have slavery. They legit have slavery. Did you know this? That's, that's frustrating. <laughs> no, seriously, like, 1982 was legally outlawed, but the, um, the punishment for it was essentially a ticket. And, um... Shit, that's what I want to do. And then, um, 2007, they finally made it, like, a criminal thing. But I had a buddy, he's a, a mining engineer, and what he does is, like, if you have a mine and there's a certain piece of equipment, you got to call his company. He went there, and it was owned by, I don't I'm probably getting the wrong, like, Arab uh, mine owners, and, like, there were a couple other Australian contractors, and he saw these uh, black workers, and they were sort of moping around, and, like, like, my friend's like, what the fuck's wrong with these guys? Why are they sort of moping around? And, like, the Australians are like, they're slaves. So, like, I hate bringing this up because, like, I'm a... Because, I don't know, like, uh, I feel like a Debbie Downer or something. But, you know, like, the fact that that still exists is, is kind of crazy. And, like, it's not even, like, debt peonage or anything like that. It's, like, just straight-up slavery, but we just ignore it. So, anyway, sorry, that was my Maritania rant. So I want you to know, if I was president, I would launch a moral crusade against human rights abuses. But let's be honest, it would have to start in the United States. You can't really be preaching out to the rest of the world when uh, your own shit isn't in order at home. Well, but... All right, is, no, that, but is, that, is that too much editorializing for a... Uh, no, no. Just, no, basically I, I was going to say that, like, uh, uh, we need to do uh, kick-ass stuff. Like, human rights, that's, that's not American way. We need to... Just straight up kick ass. So, so we 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 enforce our beliefs on other people. We don't do it on ourselves. Yeah, it's not great. 
I don't know. Why haven't you won this mission yet? I don't know. I don't know. We'll call it in a little bit here if I haven't I haven't finished it. I, I really don't know what's the matter with me. I think it's because I picked the guns that are single shot guns instead of going with the practical ones. I see. You're making a one man assault on a German fortified position with a sniper rifle. That's exactly what I'm doing. Like I do this in Battlefield games and stuff too, or uh, like Call of Duty games. I'll, I'll be the one idiot that picks the single shot rifle as opposed <laughs> to, you know, something that makes sense. Submachine gun? Yep. You need this to get off Facebook. Facebook's terrible for you. Yeah, it is. Like, it, it's hey. just a bunch of old people and they're, they're annoying. What go other to Instagram games? or I... something. You're a handsome fella. Go on Instagram and meet fellow Instagram on... people. All right, well, stay on there. Don't go on Facebook anymore. Okay, I won't. It's bad for your health. It is. I, I really legitimately think it is. Like, I, when I... I, I, the only reason I want on there is to contact you, and it was like a nightmare. Like, I, I saw people I haven't seen in, in years, and it was just... Everybody knows what's better than everybody else politically and, and stuff like that, so... Yeah, it's not great. Go on there. Hey, what other games do you play? Well, don't. I want to talk Facebook. Um, so I play right now. I just finished Last of Us Two, which was awesome. Not as good as Last of Us One, but it was it was just incredibly pretty. And then, um, oh, I beat that part. I'm badass. Uh, and I'm about to play the Ghosts of. I can't. I don't know the Japanese name. Do you know which one I'm talking about? No. It's a samurai versus the Mongols got a historical basis. You idiot! Like, I just killed everybody over there, and this guy's just standing here. I don't know! You haven't heard that one? Ghosts of Tsushima, I think is what it's called. Oh, okay, I've heard of that. It's really, it's supposed to be really good. Mm. Oh my God. Well, I'm glad you enjoy it. I, I don't have a lot of time to play games lately. I've tried picking up Divinity Original Sin 2 again, but I haven't made a lot of progress recently. I played like for a couple hours this week, but then I couldn't because I'm still working on editing my dissertation. What is your dissertation? What are you arguing? I mean, so I study daily life in Montelimar during the war. Well, that's I what I want to hear. Like, I've been asking you how these guys live. Like, what, what are they doing? No, you're asking about the colonial soldiers. I'm talking about French civilians. Like, French oh, you're, okay, oh. so, like, just average Joe Schmo living around here? Mm. I mean, probably not there, but I mean, southern France. So what are they? What are they doing? What are they eating? Yo, son, they are eating uh, less as time goes on, because food rationing restrictions become more severe as the war progresses. They're getting like 250 grams of meat a week. Like, I, I don't. I convert that to American. That it's very little. Okay. It's like ounces. It's like, you know, you get six ounces of pork a week to eat. Is Germany taking this? Like, are, is Germany confiscating it? So it's twofold. Uh, it's that, but also there's also limited supply to begin with. And so they have to ration it so that they have enough then to feed, you know, civilians. Turns out, though, that, like, not ev like everyone isn't getting enough. So then you see this huge black market erupt throughout all of France uh, where... Farmers especially are making a killing uh, because they're the only ones in French society who are eating well because, you know, they're the ones growing mm -hmm. a lot of the, the food that and maintaining the food that the rest of France has to eat. They need to switch to potatoes because they all eat wheat and that's a very inefficient, calorie inefficient crop. Well, I'll let you go back in time and tell them that. Did, um, like... Was that a, a like a recognition? Like, did did uh, Germany basically say, "You guys grow this shit for us"? Like, did they force them to grow certain things? Or no, 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 no not that. It's just uh, they would requisition and confiscate it, or pay you know very meager sums for it. Okay. So they would pay for it though. Like, maybe late 1944 like, they stopped paying. So at a, uh, so farmers would sell their wares. There's there's a really good exploration of this in uh, the book uh, Marianne in Chains by Robert Gildea. 
uh, probably one of the best like single volume works of French daily life during World War II. Um, and in that, he really he uh, describes a series of concentric, what he describes as concentric circles that surround uh, farmers. But the me immediate level, you have you know your neighbors and your family. They're getting you, the food first. They're getting the food first. They're getting the best deals. You know, you know your friends, so you're even giving them some food for free if they need it from time to time. Then, in the next circle, you have... Uh, at the next circle, you have, like, the local towns you're by. So it's like, you know, friends of a friend who come by. And they generally get fair prices. Um, then you have a larger circle, like larger metropolitan areas. And that's when you start to see upselling. Um, and, you know price fixing, etc. you know. And then at the largest level, major metropolitan areas where, you know, getting your hands on some meat or, you know, a pound of butter is extraordinarily, prohibitively expensive. Um, because the way that, you know, for the French ate during the war is you would have these ration tickets that would be distributed to you and you'd use those to then purchase, you know, a set amount of food uh, during the week. By Vichy France, they were... Your families. Vichy France is issuing the ration tickets? It's, it wasn't even Vichy. I mean, like, before France even surrendered, they were resorted to food rationing. So it's really a, an endemic problem that happened in France throughout the entire war, even after liberation. And they've got so much food there. Right? But, I mean, I, obviously, shit's getting torn to pieces. And soldiers are dying and all that. So, but the Germans would get sold all the, the junk, the leftover junk, for really high prices? No, 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 no. The Germans would come in and take that shit. Okay. No, I'm talking about civilian to civilian transaction. Was there like a, a big, um, oh, what would you call this? Was there guys serving both sides? Like guys that would, um, German soldiers would go to for food, like like maybe a German soldier that was really hungry or something, wasn't getting enough food, but he knows this French guy that runs this underground black market, and then maybe he would also deal with the French resistance. You see what I'm saying? Like, was there like a third party that was just out to make cash? Yeah, those are exploiters. Uh, it's what Philippe Buren calls accommodation. Um, Buren's uh, kind of exploration is uh, people have city and the higher governmental officials um, but it equally applies to people at the lower levels of society um, whereby they're forced to live with the German occupier right if Germany's occupying your land you have to interact with them and naturally over time you know some relationships form that aren't necessarily antagonistic um, and so yeah they you know if you establish good relations uh, with your local unit and they've been there a while, you're more likely to see them as a not as strictly the enemy as you might otherwise. Uh, there's a really good dramatization and representation of this in the French original drama series called Un uh, Village Francais or a French Village, and uh, it kind of highlights. Uh, the dilemmas that both French and German soldiers face uh, throughout the war. Uh, the girl thing where they shaved all the girl, French girls that fell in love with German soldiers, they shaved their heads. Did you run across any of that stuff in your research? Or was that a like little, after that, the war was fighting was really, done? There's a really popular uh, photo on the National Archives website. And uh, um, and it says that, like, you know, this woman is suspected of, you know, fraternizing with the Germans in the Montelimar area in, you know, August 1944, and it's called a horizontal collaboration. Oh, no. Uh, whereby, you know, women are, are shamed, um, and symbolically shamed, you know, through the shaving of their heads for having what... It, you know, people would refer to as improper relations with German soldiers. Well, how uh, the fuck do they? I don't know. I feel kind of feel bad. 
I mean, you know, it, like, some people were open about it, some people were, uh, not as open about it, but you know, like, word gets around, especially in smaller towns, everyone's in everyone else's business. Were there any German soldiers that were here through, like, all four years in France? Because if I was a German soldier, I would want to be in France all four years. Or I guess uh, five years. For, so for many, for, from 1940 up through about 19, the middle part of 1943, France, soldiers were sent to France primarily to rest and refit because it was a quiet sector of uh, foreign Europe. And um, until that serial killer came came around, did you hear about that guy in Paris? Oh, he did yeah, the guy in Paris. Yep, it's like wasn't he a dentist or something? Yeah, exactly. I think he would tell Jews he was gonna get them out, but he had to put them under, and then he would kill them. Is that right? If I think oh, of a different, different guy. No, no, that's exactly the guy. Okay. It, it, and uh, and apparently killed like 70 people that way, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And he got caught because he was trying to burn the bodies in his basement and there's a lot of black smoke coming out of his Paris apartment. And like the Germans and the French police were like, what the fuck is this going on out of this apartment? Oh, well that's fun. That's fun that they work together to stop shooting. <laughs> yeah, coming together more. Have you heard about the one, uh, the serial killer in Berlin? He would, he would attack women on trains, he apparently. So, like, you know, they're having all these bombings and everything, and they have this this guy. I don't think he was ever caught, but, like, he would uh, um, go on the trains at night, women coming home from work, and just uh, kill them or something. Kill, like, 29, like 30. Shit's me. So that's, that's what I want you to switch your research to, is finding serial killers in southern France. Where the hell am I supposed to go, Cameron? Like, I'm I've sitting here killing these guys. I can't go there. I came from that direction. Destroy AA positions. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay. This is the first time I've ever seen this game played, so I cannot tell you what to do. Okay. Well, oh shit. Well, fuck. I didn't realize that was a bazooka. I didn't realize it was a bazooka, Cameron. Brad. I think I told you I was only going to keep you an hour, but I want to keep you a little bit longer because we're talking about serial killers. And I'll, I'll keep you for like five more minutes, okay? People, people got to die. Yeah. Like I'm sitting here playing a game about, you know, intense combat, but I just want to hear about weird, crazy people. Mm, I mean, Ollie Murphy was a crazy guy. You think so? I mean, you gotta be. Oh, dude. I mean, you know he became like a fucking like super famous. He reenacted his own fucking shit in movies. Did like, he really like kill 250 people? I mean, no. Probably he didn't. Not. Okay, that's what I was. I always thought that was sounded really high. That's super high. Yeah, I think I read that on Wikipedia or something. So I don't know. That. On D-Day, Audie Murphy received the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the second highest. Uh, award you can receive for valor. It's like the one that's just below the Medal of Honor. Yeah. Well, in that because, well, I don't know. He, he didn't get like a he got some for Italy too, I think, right? In Italy, he uh, mm, he did some. I think he he had captured some Italian officers. Or that. He got malaria. Oh, he got and malaria. It, there you go. That's it, what I meant yeah. to say. He got a bronze. He got a bronze oak leaf cluster for his bronze star. Well, tell me more shit about southern France before, before I let you go. Tell me interesting stories. Tell me like the interesting thing you've got about um, your dissertation. Something that really surprised you. Uh. The sheer number of different kinds of troops that came through the area throughout the course of the war. So in Montelimar, there was a... At the beginning of the war, there was actually a Tunisian regiment, a colonial regiment, stationed in the city. And they had a really good rapport with the population. They got... they left. You then had a bunch of second-rate troops come through and fill it. You know, uh, in the French constitution, 
uh, quartering of soldiers is like mandated through the levee en masse, like you know the French Republican tradition of the levee en masse. I did not know that. Yeah, so it's like French soldiers act or French civilians actually see it as their patriotic duty to house and billet soldiers on their property, which is you know in complete up to our Fourth Amendment. Perfect. Yeah. Um. So you have all these soldiers staying with civilians, and that naturally causes problems when like soldiers fuck shit up on people's property. Um, but you had in Montélimar at least you had French Third Republic, you had Vichy France, you had Italians, you had Germans, and then you had American soldiers all coming through at one point or another throughout the war. You also had in my research I found that uh, a battalion of uh, Indo Chinese colonial soldiers stayed in the city. Really? Yep. Man, I love that kind of interaction. Like, like, was there any weird, fun stories that came out of that? Uh, wait, say that again? Like, from the Indo-Chinese soldiers, like, was there any, like, you know, sharing of cuisine or anything like that? Because, you know, I mean, obviously the French have been in Indochina for a long time, but... In New Year's Eve, uh, 1944, 1945, uh, and where did they come from? Because Indochina was taken over by Japan, so like, did they yeah, get out beforehand? <laughs> they got liberated. Not only that, but like, you know, there were a bunch of soldiers. Oh, well, I thought got... you were talking about during World War II. Yeah, I am. Really, I thought I thought uh, Indochina didn't get retaken until forty-five. I, mean, I don't know, maybe. I don't. I don't fucking study the Pacific Theater. Okay, well, whatever. So they they come over here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's a battalion of Indo-Chinese colonial soldiers, um, and a squad of them on New Year's Eve uh, ambush this farmer's house, shoot at the farmer and his wife, and steal a pig so that they can cut it up and like, uh, like celebrate with it for New Year's. Um, and they... The next day, the French farmer goes to complain, takes his son down to the camp where the Indo-Chinese soldiers are staying at, and they almost get, like, mobbed by the Indo-Chinese soldiers who, like, tell them off. But the French police in the city end up coming to the aid of the farmer and his son, and, uh, kind of like, you know, there's this big standoff, um, and the soldiers responsible are, like, kind of disciplined. But not really. Uh huh. We have their version of the story why they did it. They're just hungry, or they just needed it for the celebration, or they thought maybe they deserved it, or no, there's like celebration for the new year. Okay, so hey, I need it. You have it. Let's go get it. Yeah, exactly. So I think we're leaving before the, the fun part because this looks fun. It's like this other part is boring, but this this looks like we're about to attack a, a chateau. I mean, maybe. Is there any taking of chateaux? Like, de like des canons de campagne the Germans. Sur cette colline. So one of my favorite ça stories is, uh, de tout from War II is uh, Aimé. Castle Prends Eater. Have you, do you know what I'm attaquer. talking about? Like it's 45, Wait. Germany's over with. Like I think it's like April. I think it's oh, after okay. Hitler committed oh. suicide. You have this these POWs being kept in this castle in I think yeah. Austria or something. Yeah, Austria. Yeah, and then, and then the uh, Germans abandon it, and so they're telling the POWs, you can go, we're getting the hell out of here. But then these SS soldiers hear about that, and they go to kill the people, and American troops and German troops, like, right. who don't want to, you know, let's not kill defenseless prisoners, had to defend this castle against the SS soldiers. You, do you ever hear about any fun stories in uh, southern France like that? No, 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 that's all... That's, actually, there's a guy in uh, in Montelimar. He was one of the. He was a member of the city council, and he was also a member of like the fascist organizations in Vichy, France. He retreated with the Germans into uh, Sigmaringen, which was you know the Vichy enclave, where they all retreated to. He uh, took his family with him, and as the French approached uh, Sigmaringen in April 1945, he committed suicide with him and his family hmm. uh, near. Church. And uh, he left a note, and the note read, uh, I would rather die with my family here than be subject to uh, 
political persecution back in France. So what what happened to those guys? I mean, I, I you can't arrest everybody that fought with the Vichy, Vichy France. Like you can, you you can. Like I mean, there's a thing called the purges, la Epoxion, that happened, which was the the process of legally prosecuting uh, known collaborators. Really? So. For, um, but wouldn't that be like half of France or something, or was it just sort of those who were really gung ho in supporting Germany while they were in there? I mean, yeah. So those are the people who got the most. What? Hold on. I'm trying to find the exact numbers. Une grosse machine dégueulasse, sans répit, sans pitié. Une fois dedans. Oh, that's stupid. Uh, from 1944 to 1951, France sentenced 6,700 people to death for participating, uh, for being convicted of treason in collaborating with the Germans. But they only carried out 800 of them. That okay, that sounds about right. Um, a lot of people served some prison time. Uh, but then they were eventually all uh, like granted amnesty because it was kind of like let's uh, bury the past and move on in the name of national unity. Was um was it here that the American the only American to get uh, executed for cowardice was that in southern France? No idea. No idea. Okay. Because I I'd heard there was only one American that was uh, executed for cowardice, but I, I can't remember about that. Do you have any more fun stuff to talk about? Because I, I told you I'd let you go, but anything anything else interesting before we get out of here? Mm, I mean, really just the takeaway that the invasion of southern France was the Allies' most successful amphibious operation in the war. Uh, it was the least bloody, the best planned, and the best executed one. Part of that had to do with the fact that uh, a lot of German forces were taken from southern France to contest what was happening in northern France. Uh, but regardless, the Allies took advantage of the opportunities presented to them at that moment in time. And uh, actually, Dwight Eisenhower, in his memoir, Crusade in Europe, says, Nothing contributed nothing contributed more to the final defeat of the enemy than that second invasion from southern France. But, I mean, he would say that because this was kind of his baby, right? Well, I mean, he supported it. Um... But this also came at a time when Churchill's also releasing his uh, his six-volume World War II history, in which he, you know, consistently says that Operation Anvil is a mistake, and he says that it was, despite the fact that it uh, succeeded wildly, and he was actually agreed to it at the conference uh, between the Soviets, the Americans, and the British in December 1943. So what you're saying basically is it's. It's a success, but it um, was so successful, we're, that's why there's not Saving Private Ryan about it, right? Pretty much. Like, there's no super heroic story to tell. Okay. Alright, well, got anything else? Uh, there, actually, the historiography of the operation itself is also pretty shitty. Um, I would recommend that for those interested in reading more about the operation, would be to consult the official Army Green Book history. Um, so, the Army released 87 volumes chronicling the U.S. Army in World War II. The book about Operation Anvil Dragoon was the very last one released, and it was released in 1993. Oh, really? Yep. It's kind of been a sweet gig being the guy that got to write that one. Yeah, Jeffrey Clark and uh, Ross T. Smith are the two authors, uh, and they worked at the Center for Military History. Okay. Um, and what your dissertation, uh, do you have a title for it? And do you think it's going to be the title of the book? If I'm, I like my dissertation title because it's short and succinct. It's not, you know, three lines long like a lot of dissertations. Yep. It's uh, called Occupied, the Civilian Experience of Mont Telemar from 1939 to 1945. That's too fucking long. No, it's not. It's actually really short. Well, all right, it's too long and then Occupied, that's, that's, there's nothing... Um, unique to this area, so you got to do like, you got to do something like croissant or something like op 
occupied croissant or something. You gotta French it up. So no, we know not what we're talking about. That's only Mar. There's a little accent in the city name, so that's that's foreign enough. But couldn't you say so like it's it, Mont? I'm assuming means means Mount. Couldn't you say like Mountain of Bread? No, what? No, that's stupid. No, what it is is Montelimar was named after a family in like the early like 1000s. Mont de is it De Lamar? Montelimar. So M that's not French. That's not like oh, Mount of the Sea or anything, is it? No, what? Like I thought you said Mont de Lamar, like it, it no, that's basically Spanish for Mountain of the Sea. So I thought maybe French oh, would sing. You have no ability to pick up accents. Well, I know. I don't. I, I'm not claiming that, but you have no ability to write good uh, dissertation titles. My title is exactly one word long, and the subtitle is like the civilian experience in Montelimar. Is five. My title is six words. Ooh, who's this guy? That looks. Uh, look happy. Well, but it, everything's occupied, so we don't know what occupied it is. Um, so yeah, you need to. Go ahead and take a new one. Anyway, thank you, Cameron Zinsu. Everybody, uh, look out for uh, his book whenever it comes out. Um, but it's not going to be called Occupied because the publisher will tell him to pick something better. Thank you for coming actually, on, Nick Cameron. Actually, they won't because my argument is about the nature of occupation itself, which is why I chose that word. Maybe uh, if you read dissertation, you'll learn more about it, Brad. No, but I. I all right, anyway, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for having me on. All right. I'll see you. It's going to take a second for me to get out of here and then uh, turn this off. So don't start cussing and telling me horrible things just yet. All right. Yeah, here we go. See you later, Cameron.